Grant. I work here at the Marin County Office of Education. Um, and uh, we're here tonight uh, to address a very important topic that is already having a significant impact on our community and our country. And um, we hope that you guys um, will represent your respective school communities and, and bring this information that you gain, um, get tonight back to your schools and neighborhoods and communities. And we have a really incredible panel of speakers tonight who are going to give us a broad overview on the topic and the concerns and some of the details that um, I certainly don't know about. Um, uh, we have uh, Gia Asher, who's a student at, uh, at Terrell High School. Uh, John Hirsch, who's a teacher at Redwood High School, and also the Tupe coordinator, the Tobacco Use Prevention Education Coordinator at the high school. Our public health officer, Dr. Matt Willis, is here tonight. And then Dr. John Ma, who is the president of the San Francisco Marine Medical Society, is going to tell us some of the medical aspects of uh, vaping. And um, uh, Jasmine Gary is with the Bay Area Community Resource, um, the Bay Area Community Resource. She's with Bay Area Community Resources. <laughs> She's the tobacco prevention coordinator and really an incredible uh, organizer and spokesperson around this. So with no, without further ado, the plan is to maybe take about 20 to 25, maybe the most 30 minutes um, for the panelists to uh, go over their component of the concern and then we'll, we want to have plenty of room for questions and answers at the end. And also know that this um, event tonight is being videotaped so that it will be linked up to our website so that other members of the community can uh, gain the wisdom that we're going to get here tonight. So without further ado, uh, Gia Asher, our student, is going to start. Hello, my name is Gia Asher Lagleva. I am a student at the Marin School of Environmental Leadership, which is a magnet school that is a part of Terralinda High School. And I am currently interning there we go. Um, that's why I am. I am currently interning for the Marin County Health and Human Services Department, and my internship focuses on um, nicotine, uh, nicotine use among teens. And so now I'll be walking you guys through some of the products that are on the market, vaping products that are on the market. So first, I'm going to be going over the. I'm going to be going over the um, different types of nicotine vaporizers that are being used today. And so starting in the upper left-hand corner, we have the e-hookah, um, which is preloaded and disposable. Right next to that, uh, that box-looking one, that is called Mod. It is battery-powered and is known to be a more powerful um, nicotine vaporizer. Um, right next to that, we have the e-pipe, which contains the same uh, e-liquid concentrations as other popular um, nicotine vaporizers. And then on that bottom left-hand corner, we have arguably the most popular nicotine vaporizer among teens today, which is Juul. Um, Juul actually owns 63% of the market share. Um, and then on that bottom right-hand corner, we have Soren and Fix. Soren being the multicolored round products there, and Fix being the more Juul-looking one. These two are also very popular among teenagers. Now, not only are there nicotine vaporizers, but there are also cannabis vaporizers. Um, the two different types of cannabis vaporizers are um, the dab pen and the vape pen. The dab pen contains cannabis oils, whereas the vape pen contains a wax. However, both have around a 98% THC concentration and po or potency. Um, and as you can see, these look very similar to Juul, especially this one in the corner right there that looks similar to Juul. That can actually be um, used with either the cannabis oil or the wax. And the reason why it looks so similar to Juul is because the company that created this product, Pax Labs, um, co-patented the design with Juul, um, which is why they look so similar. And unfortunately, I know and have seen the majority of my peers use these products inside of school and outside of school. And while I know that this is a pressing issue for high school students, I think what is even larger concern is the fact that um, it is also an issue for middle schoolers. Um, I'll be now, now handing it off to the next speaker. Hi, my name is John Hirsch. I'm a social studies teacher at Redwood High School in Lawrenceburg. 
I've been doing that for about 15 years, and I am the tobacco use prevention educator, uh, which means I coordinate all tobacco and nicotine related education events, uh, classroom presentations, what have you. And uh, a couple of years ago, when the county got this, or uh, last year when the county got the grant back to do this, um, you know, the landscape had really started to change in the sense that you know, four or five years ago, the, the vaping, vaping among kids was something that was really kind of on the down low, but it, you know, we realized that we needed to get back out ahead of it, and I'm always learning. I am constantly trying to see what research is out there. And one of the cool things about it is everyone that I work with, Kristen and Jazzy and uh, everyone else, we're really collaborating a great deal to make sure that we're all on the same page with all the new research that's coming out, making sure that we're trying to get as much of that information out to our kids as we can. And one of the ways that I do that, as you can see up here, is I coordinate with a group of peer educators that I've recruited. I do some presentations myself, for example, just this afternoon, I presented to our JV football team at Redwood High School uh, with a presentation that I tailored for them because it had come to our attention that there was something of a big culture among uh, some, of the, uh, some of the social groups on the team. Uh, we are presenting as a group of my peer educators and I to the PTSA at Redwood, to the Redwood staff, because a lot of staff really don't know what they're looking for. But when it comes to working with the Redwood students on this, it really is a give and take, in the sense that they have boots on the ground. They tell me what they see. And as we build trust and we build chemistry as a group, uh, they become more open to the suggestions I have, and I, they tell me things. They tell me more and more about what's going on so that I can really have my eyes open. And uh, one of the main things that we've tried to do is to push into ninth grade social issues classes. Social issues is where Redwood students get their health component uh, that's required by the state. And uh, every social issues teacher at Redwood High School has been completely receptive to it. So. Uh, this year, which is the first year that we're going, you know, August to June, every freshman should get a 45-minute lesson delivered by highly prepared uh, juniors and seniors on vaping, on nicotine, and uh, the associated issues. Um, as far as my other responsibilities, uh, I have some uh, administrative responsibilities in the sense that I coordinate with our administration. We know that use has been rising anecdotally because two years ago, three years ago, we weren't seeing any kids that were getting busted vaping. Now we're seeing dozens of kids that are getting busted, let alone the kids who are hiding it well. Uh, we walk into bathrooms and we see you know, I'll walk into the bathroom and I'll see, you know, kids that aren't really doing anything, but just kind of standing there. Right? <laughs> and walk in like, okay. You know, it's not quite enough for me to do something about it, though I've caught kids, you know, passing a jewel to each other and take them downstairs. But uh, I really am grateful for the support of the Redwood administration in this regard because it really does take a village. I mentioned working with Jazzy and working with Kristen and working with all the other 2P, 2P educators, but the Redwood administration has been hugely supportive of me and working with our wellness center staff and really making sure that kids who get caught vaping have a quick intervention that is effective, that is tailored to that group, and then there is a follow-up if things change, if there's a second offense, and so we really have this strategy really well mapped out to make sure that no one falls through the cracks. And it's just getting better and better. So I'm really grateful for the support that I have. Um, that's, I think, all I have. Yeah. Thank you, John. Good evening, everyone. I'm Matt Willis, Public Health Officer for the County. Um, John made an interesting observation that talked about a culture of vaping that emerged in one of the school communities. I think from my perspective, part of the goal of tonight is to how do we create a culture where we are informed and in actually protecting our children against this epidemic. It has been called an epidemic, it's a word that's being thrown around a lot, the opioid epidemic. 
An epidemic, by definition, is the rapid increase in a phenomenon of uh, across a population that contributes to disease. And by that definition, this is actually an epidemic because vaping does contribute to illness. Um, so I want to thank you all for, for coming to, to join us in this, in this endeavor of trying to protect our community. Um, I want to walk you through a little bit of my process as a health officer and trying to learn about this. So there's a, there's a jewel pod going around. Is it still making its way around? Okay. So if, how many of you have ever actually held one before? So the majority of us have not. Um, and there's an analogous, you know, in my own world as a health officer, as I try to educate myself about this issue. This has accelerated so quickly that our understanding of this from a public health standpoint and from a regulatory standpoint has actually lagged behind. Um, and this is just a, you know, I was learning about this and I was told that people are using cannabis in jewels and in other, in other vaping products. So I wanted to educate myself about this, so I Googled butter because I was, I understood that wax was one of the products that people are using. And this is what I learned, that butter is a form of THC or cannabis that is a waxy product. Um, again, these are, these are words, these are not, you don't learn these terms in medical school. These are slang, slang vocabulary. But I also thought it was amusing that under there, the people also ask, what is the difference between wax and shatter? What is terp sauce? How do you dab shatter? What is terp jelly? Like, none of those words. <laughs> the, the, you know, the noun and the verb, how do you dab and shatter? So that's kind of gives you a sense of where we are now. And the social networks that our children travel around, things happen so quickly, and we as adults are trying to just catch up. So I think that's part of the, sort of the larger trajectory of this for us. The reason we're here tonight is partly because of the results of a survey that was um, finalized a month ago, early, early October. Um, um, we got the results of the California Healthy Kids Survey and found that um, we had seen a doubling in the number of Marin County youth who were vaping on a regular basis. So 2016, this was a, even then, recognized as an issue for us, and we were working in, um, in our schools to try and educate and try and prevent people from vaping. Despite those efforts, we actually saw more than doubling in the number of high school juniors who were reporting to vape at, at, on a regular basis. There's 28% of our high school juniors, that second, the second paired column there, from 11% in 2016 to 28% in 2018. And then um, an increase also from 3% to 13% said that they do it regularly in the school setting. We also saw corresponding increases in ninth graders and in seventh graders. Lower total numbers, but also more than doubling in those. So that became sort of the call to action that we needed to, to gather together to address this issue. Why do we care um, that children are behaving more frequently? Obviously, it's because we're concerned about the harm that it represents. Um, you'll hear from the marketers in the, in the industry that vaping can be a better than cigarette smoking. It's actually a way for adults to stop smoking is what they will endorse. But the evidence for that is mixed in adults. There is clear evidence in children that actually vaping is an entry into cigarette smoking because of the habituation of a regular, regular inhalation of a substance that will offer you nicotine. And from once that sort of habit has been formed, it's a couple degrees to cigarette use. So it actually increases the risk of cigarette use among young people. There are toxic contents in vaping products, even those that don't contain nicotine, carcinogens, and other unknown compounds. Part of the problem here is that it's been so unregulated that we don't actually know what are in some of these products. The nicotine effects themselves, which Dr. Ma will get into, it is one of the most highly addictive substances. As a primary care physician, I had many patients who were suffering from addiction. It might be cocaine, heroin, alcohol, and smoking, and my patients who were smoking sometimes reported that that was the most difficult thing for them to actually stop. They may, you know, stop using heroin, but they could not stop using nicotine. So it is a highly addictive substance. Then there's the whole problem of secondhand vaping, if the same issue we have with, with cigarette smoking. Someone may be vaping. You've seen the cloud of vapor that comes off. So anyone in the environment who doesn't have a choice is actually being subject to whatever's in that vaping product. 
Um, and there's vaping and other substances, including cannabis. It's illegal for young people. Um, and it's difficult to detect and identify use. So we'll talk more about those issues. This is just a, a broad overview, and we look forward to more conversation later. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to share my thoughts tonight. My name is John Ma. I'm the president of the San Francisco Marin Medical Society. We merged uh, San Francisco and Marin's year uh, on our 150th anniversary. Uh, I've also served on behalf of the American Heart Association over at the Office of the President. Thank you to all of you who voted yes on Prop 56. It created funding to study electronic cigarette use and the health harms of cigarette smoking. Each year, approximately 440,000 Americans die from smoking, most uh, often attributed to cancers, heart disease, and strokes. An estimated 40,000 more die from secondhand smoke exposure. I had the opportunity to speak with President Obama to urge him to sign the electronic cigarette deeming regulations in 2016 which have been put on hold, but hopefully there will be progress forward in the next few months and years. These are these benign, somewhat innocuous looking tobacco plants, when converted, when manufactured, added with a filter, which really doesn't help in reducing its carcinogenicity, carcinogenicity uh, become the most lethal product known to and sold to mankind. If you looked at the profits of the tobacco industry, the most lucrative stock in the history of Wall Street is not Google or Facebook or Amazon or any of the companies that you might think. It is Altria, the parent company of Philip Morris. If you had invested $1 in their stock in 1968, it would be worth nearly $7,000 today. If you had invested $1 in the year 1900, it would be worth nearly $7 million today. I was asked to speak specifically about the effects of nicotine and the process of addiction. What nicotine does after you most commonly inhale it, it enters your pulmonary vasculature and it gets into your circulation and it finds its way to the brain. And so there is a receptor, the nicotinic receptor, that usually is activated by the small molecule acetylcholine, but nicotine can bind to it and it can activate the receptor and sodium and calcium are mobilized, and they result in the release of dopamine, a neurotransmitter, sorry, that is in the process of addiction. You can see here the vesicles that are being signaled and stimulated to release dopamine across the synapse. The primary effect is in the Nucleus accumbens, the ventral tegmental area, the mesolimbic part of your brain, which is really, we divide our brain sort of into the rational, the forebrain, which controls thought, empathy, the higher emotions, and then there's the central portion of the brain, which is really the fight or flight, the more primitive physiologic effects. So what nicotine does is it triggers this cascade uh, through your brain, through the activation of the nicotinic receptor, leading to dopamine, which is creates sensations of comfort, of pleasure, of joy, and it's what leads to the process of addiction. These receptors become uh, downregulated, they proliferate, and you reach this new state where you're accustomed to having nicotine around more frequently. So there's a dual hazard here. First, the nicotine is a stimulant, and you have pleasurable responses from using it. And then when you're not using it, it triggers this withdrawal symptoms, and which can make you very depressed, can make you feel to have a very uh, down outlook, and feel the need to smoke immediately. And so you're battling both of these. Uh, this is just uh, highlighting again that we think of the prefrontal cortex, which deals with the emotions of empathy, insight, uh, regulation, morality, intuition. It's the mesolimbic brain that is in the central portion that is dealing with your flight fight and freeze response, and the two of them together are what are being manipulated by nicotine. And the effect of particular concern is on youth, on the developing brain, in adolescents and in teenagers, when all of these neural networks have not been fully activated. So the effect of marijuana on the brain is a little bit less well understood, and there's a specific reason. It's because it's been illegal to possess. So most of the great centers like UCSF and Stanford, they have, it's very, it's been very difficult to study this because you've had, they've only been able to study a single strain, there are all of these requirements and licensure and safety and the product that's been stored. And so most would, the, the uh, activation pathway is different. In 
instead of involving the nicotinic receptor, marijuana triggers a cannabinoid receptor. And it doesn't, we don't believe at this point that it quite involves the dopamine addiction pathway as clearly, but very simply, most of the research at this time suggests that marijuana simply destroys many of the neurons in your brain uh, and across all of these sections that are highlighted here, whether it be the hypothalamus, the amygdala, the brainstem, the cerebellum, it just has a direct toxic effect. The, the effect is more concerning when you start smoking marijuana earlier as a teen, as an adolescent. They've done longitudinal studies and it concluded that your IQ scores will be impacted adversely by the time you reach uh, adulthood. You know, I'm a surgeon, I'm the chief of uh, general surgery over at Marin General Hospital. What I see on a daily basis, the health harms of nicotine addiction, is in leading to increased rates of pneumonia, healthcare costs, respiratory failure, reintubation. You can see the chest x ray in the upper left of a patient who has a pneumonia. Uh, I do a lot of abdominal surgery, and these are pictures of uh, a wound that's not healing well because there's been an infection. Smoking, it's very interesting to me. We study so many molecules and processes and all the things to reduce healthcare costs in America, but clearly the simplest one is to have people stop smoking before surgery. In the United Kingdom, it's required, if you're a patient who's actively smoking, if you're going to undergo elective surgery, you have to go through a four-week smoking cessation course before you're allowed to undergo that operation. It's something I've kind of been urging for here in the United States. I'll just finish with two thoughts. Um, the tobacco industry recognized the hazards of electronic cigarettes early on. They put dire warning labels, you can see from the New York Times, early on. Safer does not mean safe. And they have fully acknowledged that there are carcinogens, and there are health hazards, there are unique hazards that result from electronic cigarettes. You have all types of metals and other carcinogens that are not present with traditional combustible cigarettes that you're exposed to. I will just finish by mentioning that electronic cigarettes, it's kind of an irony, had been first invented uh, in the 1960s by uh, an American. And they had gone to the tobacco industry and tried to convince them to market them, to sell them as an alternative to tra traditional cigarettes. But at that time, sales of traditional cigarettes were very lucrative, and so they declined. And so you fast forward, it's not until about uh, 50 years later that in 2008, it was actually in China that they became popular once again as a possible smoking cessation device. And we've just seen this skyrocketing from the initial generation of electronic cigarettes to now Juul, which uh, you've had the chance to see here, is really becoming the dominant electronic cigarette 2.0. I, I mentioned the story because of the irony. It was about a week ago that Hong Kong banned all electronic cigarettes. And I think it's a tribute to a particular woman, a tobacco control champion named Judith Mackay, who was named one of the time uh, top 100 most influential people because of her work in tobacco control. If you'll indulge me, just one last story I wanted to share. Uh, I learned that there is a video online uh, that teaches children how to trick their parents into not opening the electronic cigarette packages when they arrive. 94% of the sales of Juul, we believe, we've been told, are through the internet and online. And the retailers are violating Tobacco 21 and the licensing. But anyway, there's this video that the children, the kids, and the teens tell their parents that when the package arrives from eBay, not to open it because they are going, they're trying to make a video at school about how to open an unopened package. So just be aware of that. Thank you. Welcome, Jasmine. That's our next speaker. And sorry, just one last comment. This is Jewel. You can see the pass around. This is my mini cruiser. I just want to make it clear. This is your child's homework, and this is a smoking. This is a pathway to addiction. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Jasmine Garrity, and I work for Bay Area Community Resources and with the Coalition Connection, focusing on youth tobacco prevention. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the current laws and regulations, and I know that Dr. Ma just mentioned the deeming law, which was originally signed in 2016, however it's been put on hold. And um, basically, even with the deeming law, um, it talked about how many e-cigarette companies, they, got grant they would have been grandfathered into this law. So anything that was made prior to 2016, which does include Juul and Views and Logic, I put a couple up there, they would have gotten grandfathered into that law, which means that 
they would have until 2022 to um, file for an exemption before they would start to get regulated. So unfortunately, none of those products are being regulated at this time by the FDA. And then again, reiterating, the cannabis products are not federally regulated because they are not legal yet at that federal level. So those are um, in the works. And currently in California, all of the med medical marijuana and the adult use recreational cannabis falls under the Medicinal and Adult Use Cannabis Regulation and Safety Act which is evolving because the state doesn't really know what laws that they're going to put in place. So that's still constantly moving to this day. All right, so talking a little bit about signs about if your teenager might be vaping. So these are just a couple of the signs. However, there's plenty more that are not on this list. Um, some of them include fruity aroma or the marijuana smell. So e-cigarettes don't smell like combusting tobacco. They smell like mint and candy, and actually there's over 15,500 flavors on the market for e-cigarette products. Um, for marijuana vaporizers, you can smell the marijuana smell, but there are also flavored substances mixed in there, and so we can smell a combination of marijuana scent as well as other flavors. Um, another sign is unfamiliar handheld gadgets. So, Many e-cigarettes, as you saw in the first two slides, they come in all different shapes and sizes, and so they can look like school-related items. So it's important to ask if something doesn't look familiar to you and just say, what is this? Is this a highlighter? Or it could be an e-cigarette device. You don't know. Um, batteries and chargers are also a really good way to tell if there's um, something going on. Vapes need to be charged on a regular basis, and so if there's unfamiliar batteries and chargers, that's something that you can ask about as well. Um, you have discarded atomizers, so atomizers heat up the batter, the battery heats up the atomizer, which turns the liquid into um, a vapor and an aerosol, and they, um, they actually burn out after a period of time, so they do get thrown away. Um, they get thrown away at different rates depending on the product. Um, a lack of motivation, so kind of similar to a lot of the things that Dr. Moss said in regards to the brain, um, it does impair the motivation of the user and so being aware of that changing among a youth. Um, also change in appetite, that's in here because with nicotine based products it's an appetite suppressant and with marijuana products, there will actually be an increase in appetite, so that's something to look for as well. Um, so what can we do? Um, talk, starting the conversation around vaping. So same thing with everything, timing is everything. You want to approach it at the right time, the right moment. If you see an advertisement, if you see um, on social media or magazine advertisement, talk to your child about what it is that they know. And if you are under 18, ask your parents what they know. I think it goes both ways, just talking about what you know in regards to it, and that kind of leads <coughs> into getting the facts straight, just making sure that you know exactly what's going on um, and what facts you have in regards to e-cigarettes. Um, as far as teaching, school-based programs and activities, so each school actually has a program, whether it's in, within a curriculum or a course or independent. Um, each school does receive classroom-based prevention education. Um, and it'll look different at every high school, so be aware of what the curriculum is within your given high school. Um, there are also, Tobacco Use Prevention Education, which is TUPI through Murray County Office of Education, they train high school and middle school, middle school students to teach as peer educators about tobacco and nicotine prevention information. Then there's also local presentations for parents at middle school and high school events. There's a flyer that's going around that has a list of all the localized events near you. I know that um, that's printed out as well. Um, and then there are youth internship opportunities through the Marin County Health and Human Services, similar to what GIA is doing, and through um, Bay Area Community Resources. 
And then as far as resources go, each school has school counseling. Those counselors have been trained in the same training that John Hirsch has gone through for the diversion program. There are 2B coordinators at most schools, not all the schools, and those are, are uh, specific trained educators in tobacco use and prevention. Um, some schools have wellness centers, and those are a really great resource for the schools that for information and also for counseling opportunities. Um, the Coalition Connection is a great website to go to for information about vaping if you want an online resource regarding that. Bay Area Community Resources is another great one. They staff a lot of the, some of the counselors of the different schools and they provide events locally in Marin County and they include some cessation services. And then the Smoke Free Marin Coalition, which is a coalition that focuses on all of Marin County, working on local policy within different jurisdictions and at the county level. And with that, we can go into our panel. You guys have questions? Here's one. All right, so that was uh, a lot of information, a lot of good information. So um, we want to both, well, we want to open it up to questions. And um, I'll do my best. I'm going to pass around the microphone for anyone. If you have a question, okay, I see a hand going up right here. Um, is vaping directed mostly at the adults? Um, both. Um, and, and unfortunately, uh, it is, vaping is strongly directed towards youth. Um, that's one of the reasons why the FDA recently, basically, is requiring manufacturers of vaping products like Juul to, to demonstrate the ways in which they are going to systematically prevent young people from using their products because they have been clearly marketing towards young people with. I mean, those over 1,000 flavors are include things like bubblegum and unicorn poop and mermaid tears and you know things where it's it's clear that you know the, the audience they're they're trying to reach and unfortunately it's the, the data is showing us how incredibly successful that has been um, with um, with a, do a doubling you know almost half of our kids have, have vaped at least once in Marin County or 48 percent and and our 11th graders one in three are using it on a regular basis. Um, I just want to reiter reiterate that point with regards to adults. The, the primary marketing is that it is less harmful than cigarettes and that it can be an exit for adults. Whether or not that's true, we need to all be crystal clear that for children, it's actually an entryway into cigarette use. Another question. So, so I'm going to go here and I'll come back up here. I have a question about school policy. What, what is the policy? What can you hear me now? What is the school policy in middle schools right now for when a child gets caught with a, a jewel on campus? Middle school specifically, uh, and, and high schools, uh, it's going to vary from district to district. Um, I one of the things that my peer educator team and I have been talking about doing is working on our articulation with the middle school specifically, although um, I can only speak to Redwood High School policy and imagine that other schools are similar. With uh, the Tamil Pius Union High School District, that's Tam Drake, Redwood, Tam Scal, and San Andreas, uh, nicotine-based products are an outlier in terms of students caught abusing any substance. If there's anything other than nicotine, the, the first, uh, it's, it's a suspension. But with nicotine products, it's an intervention. So they will, like, if a kid is caught vaping, juuling, the first thing that they do is they, they talk to the assistant principal involved, and then that assistant principal refers them to me. And at Redwood High School, the policy is that they have two separate meetings with me. And uh, there's a follow-up at the end of the year. But then if it's a second <coughs> offense, then ref we refer them to our wellness center for more emotionally-based counseling. Are parents called as soon as kids are found, or is it a case-by-case basis? Uh, I, I believe so, yes. Yeah, I will, I will double-check on that to make sure, but I believe so. 
I just need one more piece of context for the middle school setting. Um, so the, um, the California Healthy Kids Survey surveys seventh graders, ninth graders, and eleventh graders. The data we showed here was for eleventh graders, and obviously the, the rate is highest in that group. But for seventh graders, it increased from three percent to seven percent of seventh graders who were using vaping products on a regular basis. So it begins even you know in the middle school setting. How much do vaping materials cost? And what's the main source where kids are getting hold of vaping materials? <coughs> okay, I'll do it. Um, so for a jewel device like this, this costs usually thirty dollars retail. Um, they do offer discounts, and I know from going to different um, locations in Marin that they do offer them at discounted rates if you buy them in store. Um, as far as obtaining them, I know that, like Dr. Moss said, a lot of youth get them online, but you can also get them in retail outlets, and there's definitely some youth who are using fake IDs and going in and buying them, or they don't get carded. So that's some ways of obtaining them. I don't know if you have anything to add. Uh, these are the jewel pods. Four of these cost at 7-Eleven about $16, under $4 each. These are little flavored cigars. There are a lot of other types of products that, you know, there are a lot of issues. Those are actually cheaper. The Jewel device, you purchase it one time and then you keep reusing it. Just incidentally, the Jewel, the little pod, has as much nicotine as an entire pack of cigarettes. It's very potent. I just, can I add one thing to that, Mike? Um, we, we had recently at a meeting just this week heard from a parent who had firsthand experience with their children, group of kids, buying um, Amazon gift cards and using that to order it and have it shipped to an Amazon locker at Whole Foods or Safeway. So, so there's a lot of that going on. Do you have a question here? I just wanted to sort of add that partly because so much of it is coming from the internet that we have to assume that we're operating with an environment of choice. As much as we work on the policy side to limit access, ultimately the sort of our awareness and our knowledge and recognizing that children are making choices and we're trying to help them make healthy choices in terms of the culture is ultimately how we're going to get in front of this. So I have other questions, but to add to the, that, <coughs> it's sold, you have the jewel, and then you have the charger, and they come together, and then you can buy four flavors all in one pack and you get a discount, and you go to any any gas station, and they usually have them. And I just I just kept going to a whole bunch to find out where they were. Now, some gas stations have a fake cigarette front, let it look like there's cigarettes there, and then they flip it up. You have to ask for the jewels. So at least they're doing that. You can't walk in and just see it. But most you can see them. And so the kids are doing that. But um, the other thing that's happened is a very sweet, 14-year-old freshman girl, a very sweet freshman girl that my daughter knows, uh, just handed her backpack to my daughter last week and just said, can you hold this just a minute? And my daughter did. And then, then she gives it back and then she says, look what I had in it. I didn't want to get busted. The teachers were coming by looking at the backpack. She had 30 packs of these four packs and she was selling them at school. And so anyway, so that, they're, they're, set, they're buying them in bulk and then selling them. Okay, but that wasn't my question. Yeah, I didn't that. So the question, the, 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 um, the other signs that you can list here you can add is they'll take a phone charger, Apple charger, the short ones, long ones, whatever. They splice, they take off the end and they splice it. Because they lose their chargers. And if you can't charge up your device, you can't vape. So, and that, that the expensive part is the charger. That costs the most. So they're splicing that, and then you can temporarily charge your vape pen from the spliced charger cord. So that's how we start saying, what's going on? Every charger is ruined in our house. And it was always right after parties. And you know, like holidays. So all these teens were charging up, and they forgot to charge it. Okay, so I just say, have that. And then, um, that our problem is, so we know all these kids that are vaping, we don't know what to do next. So I've gone to pediatricians, and they're like, our pediatrician says, well, we could do a patch, we could do gum, but we don't know how much they're using. Uh, we could taper them off. Um, 
So there, there are not a lot of alternatives. And then I asked if my daughter could talk to an addiction specialist. I'm like, go to Huckleberry House and talk to a counselor. But no one's offered what we can do when we have a problem. Like, I now know all these things, but I don't have good alternatives. Yeah, I mean, I can speak to what we do. We don't have the longitudinal data. And by the way, I, I was texting my principal, uh, who says yes, parents are notified when they're cognating and that he, he assumes that middle schools do the same. So, um, as I said before, when, we, when, when a student is cognating or when a student wants help, that student comes to me and we do primarily a, uh, uh, an information-based first intervention because the pre-assessments that we're getting is that kids know very little about what's actually in them and the effects and what it does. And after that, they are offered, because we have, we're fortunate enough to have wellness centers where we have the ACR counselors, like Jazzy was mentioning. Um, they can participate in counseling, individual counseling, group counseling, uh, with the goal of, of beating an addiction, for lack of a better term. So, Redwood Tam and Drake High Schools do offer those services. Uh, unless they're caught twice, though, those services are voluntary. Just to answer about what one can do in a public policy perspective. So, electronic cigarettes, when they were first, first conceptualized, they did not have nicotine. They did not have flavorings. They were truly water vapor. They were only available in pharmacies with a physician's, a doctor's prescription. And so moving to that type of model is one possibility. Another is to look to San Francisco. They're the last piece of public health legislation signed by the late Mayor Ed Lee was to ban the sales of flavored tobacco products across all spectra. Uh, that was successfully upheld by the San Francisco voters and will be going into effect January of 2019. And it would end the sales of these types of products. So they'll come to Marin to get them? Or online, yes. <laughs> but they won't be sold in the city. Question in the back. I have a related question. So let's say we find out that our child has been vaping tobacco. We know how highly addictive it is. Who do we have to turn to for help to help them wean off the, the, the nicotine? I mean, you exist for the kids who are at high school, but who do the parents turn to? Um, so for parents specifically, I, I think that one thing that we kind of all need to get on the same page with is learning more. So starting with going to these information sessions that are going to be held locally and more in depth exactly what's happening. And then for as far as trying to reach out for a youth who's using, that's something that can be done within the school setting and actually talking to the counselors through the schools because there is that opportunity within the schools. I know that there's a couple of programs that are doing cessation services outside of the schools. There's more specific toward adult cessation youth use, and so that could be an outlet is changing that over to be both adult and youth cessation, which is what it's looking more and more like. Um, that's more on the addiction side when it goes too far. But when it's just getting started, it's definitely at that point where that you can change that, the direction of that. And you can have more education, more talking about it, trying to get through and to say, okay, what are we going to do about this? You're, you've started using, how are we going to change the direction of this before it gets worse? And if you can talk to your teenager and say, look, we can do this together. You're not doing it on your own. We'll start to decrease usage. We're going to get you off of this without using the shaming techniques or getting them in trouble techniques. I think all of it's about approaching it as it's a problem that you're going into together as a team and you're going to help them get off of it as a team. So, so there's a question right here and I'm, try, I'm trying to remember all the hands that are going on. Yeah. There's also, sorry, one more thing. There's a, a online, or there's a phone number that's a cessation service. It's 1-800-QUIT-NOW. And then, yeah, so that's also a really great resource. If you're a parent and you need help going through that process, there's, there's resources on that, that hotline, so. Mm -hmm. Just put a plug in for the pediatrician. The pediatrician will want to help. Yeah, the, 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 their, their, their primary care provider will want to help. Okay, right here. So, I was really curious, um, John Hirsch, because you're with all the teenagers. Um, I think it's good 
you aren't aware of all the paraphernalia or seeing it or understanding about the spliced cords, many things I've run across. And of course, I think my daughter's an amazing person. This is addiction. And grown people smoke for years until they have 70% lung capacity. It's super serious. And I just, I saw um, Dr. Jensen do the teenage brain, and they talk about the frontal lobe and how everything's developing and how critical and how detrimental this is. It seems like something harmless. So I think everything's, you know, good to know, but your point about going in together to tackle the problem and you're not in trouble. But my daughter drives and has a car. I don't even know where she is. I don't, how am I gonna say, okay, let's tackle this together and I get a bunch of lip service. So my question to you is, based on all that background, what's their attitude? I mean, oh, I gotta go talk to Mr. Hirsch, and you know, what's the big deal? You know, how do you get through with them? I think the best commercial I ever saw was the woman smoking through a tracheotomy hole. Yeah. And we just need something like that. I mean, come on, right? I just, how do you, what's their attitude? What are they saying to you? And, and how do you feel that? I'm, and thank you for doing what you're doing, but they're teenagers. I mean, the, first, yeah, the, the first thing I do is um, I, I, I try to get their guard down. Um, I, I welcome I welcome them and say, hey, I'm Mr. Hurst, nice to meet you, look and smile, let them know like you're not here, I'm not here to lecture you. Um, I'm here to help and I'm here to inform you. And the first thing I do is, and I love doing this when I have at least a couple of them together, is I show them a Kahoot, which is like an online quiz that you can do, and they love them. The kids love these, they, whenever they see them, they're like, yes, we get to do a Kahoot! Because they get to compete with you, they get to use their phones, they get to compete with each other, it shows them their score, and then they're basically multiple choice questions. But I do it as a pre-assessment. I mean, when I, I think I have seven questions and they'll get one of seven right, two of seven right about it. And so it, it gets them to realize, oh, maybe I don't know everything about this. And so I said, and, and we just talk. We have a conversation about it. Uh, it's very matter of fact. It's very fact based. Uh, you know, I remember that same commercial that you're talking about. But what we have to realize is that when they're in, when they're in an educational setting, different parts of their brain are switched on to the point where they have filters up against fear tactics. That when we're watching TV and we're watching commercials and we're kind of zoning out the the, the commercials a little bit, our unconscious is a lot more receptive and we tend to remember those things a lot more in little five second snippets. But when they're working with a teacher, especially a teacher who they're worried might be like wanting to do something to them, the, the, the frontal cortex and the amygdala are, are working in very different ways and so fear tactics tend to be a lot less effective. So that's why I focus on a real fact-based approach. I think that's great. Yeah. Knowledge is yeah. Yeah. And then after that, I, I, I say the next second meeting, you guys are carrying on a discussion about all the facts that you know. So there's you guys. Question are... over here where, you know, I'm trying to get around. I know there's a man who's sitting Yeah, just um, as, as a teenager, I have obviously, I've never been in this position. I mean, if I'm, you know, doing an internship for tobacco use, I probably don't use tobacco. But I do know a number of my peers and friends who do use, and they've talked to me about it. And while, you know, they, I think they aren't as educated as they should be and they don't see it as much of an issue as it really is, I think that after a certain point, there is a concern. And I have seen it among many, many people, you know, just, it's as simple as, you know, asking one another, like, hey, are you, like, going through this? Like, or is, like, can you put your jewel down, like, past 6 p.m., you know what I mean? Like, if they're, like, almost looking for each other for reassurance. And while they might not say it explicitly, I do know that maybe, I know at least some of them are concerned. And I think the main reason why they're not getting help is because it's like any other addiction. You're not, even though you might be scared of it, it's an addiction, you still need that substance. You're not going to come forth telling adults, get me off of this. It's an addiction. You're going to want to keep taking it even though you know it's a problem. So I do think they know it's a problem, and I think deep down they want to get help. But it's this, you know, um, more primitive side of your brain that 
feels as though it's a necessity, which is why they're not getting help. In yeah. you know, my opinion, I'm only a teenager, but yeah, <laughs> I'm not a doctor. <laughs> Absolutely right, and I see that with kids who come to me talking about their addiction. I have one student who managed to wean herself off, but she talks about her friends who say, I'm going to leave my jewel at home today, I'm going to leave my jewel at home, I'm not going to do it today, and then they bust home at lunch to get it because they're, they're, they're hurting. Yeah, addiction is addiction. So, um, just switching gears slightly, you guys have talked about two categories here, you know, nicotine and, and marijuana, but the one I've come across um, is these, are these disposable vape things that are more around outcome, uh, energy, diet suppression, and sleep. These neutra vapes, they're actually sold at very high quality. And I'm curious if there's any medical data around health there. They don't have nicotine. But earlier to the point Dr. Wallace you made, it's, it's, a, it's a pathway potentially to something more, more important, but these are not regulated. What kids say is that, listen, I'm not smoking, I'm not having nicotine or marijuana, so it's fine. Uh, they're much easier to buy and disposable, very hard to, to, to detect. So I'm curious if there's any, I mean, what's the health you know, concern or problem with those? Because they're actually sold at a much higher volume than the nicotine ones, so it's much easier to get. It's a great question. Uh, there are a whole world of emerging products, snooze, uh, heat not burn, and they haven't been as well characterized. Uh, it's interesting that you're witnessing this, sounds like very rapid growth. You know, I'm a doctor, and I've worked in this field for about a decade, and I've thought to myself, and I've concluded that it's not a good idea to light anything on fire and put it anywhere in your mouth or anywhere near it. It doesn't matter if it's a cigarette, marijuana, electronic cigarette, these types of uh, agents, you know, if they don't, if they should, these new products should be tested by the FDA and studied to look for, before they get market approval. Uh, it's very concerning to me because they have these benefits that are touted, but we're not really sure what the evidence surrounding them is. I can't, at this time, there's not a, insufficient data to be able to honestly answer your question, but it's deeply concerning to me. Thank you. I'd like to put a Jolly Rancher candy. I'd like to offer a Jolly Rancher. So would you like a Jolly Rancher? And they say, sure. And they take out a spoon, put the Jolly Rancher on a spoon, take a lighter, say, okay, suck it in. But they're like, yeah, inhale it. They're like, what? And, and, and I'm like, well, I mean, it's safe, right? I mean, we eat them all the time. But we, we eat them. We don't smoke it. Also. So, so inhaling something and ingesting it is different. Right? So, and the, the, all those devices, they're all attracted by by flavorants and, and other things to smooth it out. So, you know, it's, it, it, no matter what, it's not vapor and water. And, you know, and swallowing melatonin and smoking melatonin are different. And combusting it makes it a different set of molecules. Do you have any questions back here? Yes, I do. I'm going to stand because I'm short. Who's here with Talk right into it. Just talk right into it. Uh, I want to introduce myself as not the enemy. I'm Susan Telford from Telford's Pipe and Cigar. And we are totally against youth access to nicotine, jewel, uh, vapes, etc. None of which we carry. Our insurance won't let us and nor do we want to. We have pipes and cigars for adults. We are an adult only specialty tobacconist. So I just wanted to make that really clear that they cannot come to Telford's. We would, first of all, card just about everyone in this room. And secondly, we do not carry the products. What we do carry is flavored to pipe tobacco, which is of no interest to children. So hopefully we will have a carve out for pipe tobacco for our customers at Telford's. Say hi to Teresa for <laughs> my wife was my wife in high school. So I have a question. Um, what are some of the signs, at the moment signs? I'm sure there's a, some type of high. Is that would you say, like a rush or a head rush or something like that? But what are some of the signs that I can tell, say right now, that my child has been or student has been vaping or what are some of the symptoms and the effects? Um, so a couple of things that for youth users, when you're you're talking to someone and you are you want to tell whether they've been using tobacco specifically or are, do you want marijuana too? Uh, more the tobacco. 
the and tobacco. I'm at, at the moment. Not, okay. Not, you know. So for tobacco, it's definitely a little bit harder to tell than marijuana. Obviously, there's more signs, and THC can last a lot longer than nicotine can. Um, there's this thing that teenagers have been doing recently. It's called getting domed, and that's when they inhale so much of the E juice in their body that they actually have intoxication or they have toxication of having too much nicotine in their body at one time, which causes a, a short lived quick high. But ultimately, to tell if a user has been using, um, it comes down to that constant kind of agitation and same, it would be the same thing with cigarettes, a cigarette user. They constantly are needing that fix. They kind of get more agitated. They are, it's harder for them to pay attention. They don't have that same, if they've been using for a longer period of time, they don't have that same release of dopamine from other things. So they can't get that happiness level as high as when they have um, the nicotine in their bloodstream. Um, it's definitely harder to tell. I, if you're just talking to someone, you probably might not be able to notice, but if it's someone that's close to you and you can tell that these symptoms start to change among, like, throughout a period of time, then you know that they've been using constantly. I think, do you guys have anything to add? Yeah, so, um, I might, it might sound silly, but there are also ways to know if they're doing it in the present, and I mean, as, as many of you might think, like, oh, it might be obvious to tell if someone's drooling right in front of me, it's actually not. Um, yeah, students, like, I, at school, when I see kids doing this, I don't think that they're gen I don't think they're genuinely just going like this. They're probably drooling. Like, that's, I don't even, that's my first thought when I see somebody do that. And you might think, oh, well then where does the smoke go? Do they blow it in their sleeve? Well, actually, kids are trying to do this thing called ghosting it, which is where you inhale it, inhale it, inhale it so much that when you exhale it, you can't even see it. So maybe, you know, you might not be able to tell if they've been drooling if they were drooling like three hours ago. But if they're, you know, just going like this and just inhaling, 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 inhaling like a lot, that might be something to ask them about. <laughs> Yes. So the vape, the vape yeah, you test test like, I mean, if you have a child that's, you think they're smoking pot, you make them be in a cup. Can't you, are there tests that you can do for them? Yeah, Amazon sells them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's never So you guys, um, <laughs> We, we, uh, we have hit 7.30, and I, I, I know that there are a dozen hands that went up that have not gotten the microphone, and, and this is, you know, we can't answer all the questions tonight. I want to honor that it's a school night, and um, uh, say that, you know, we, I learned a great deal tonight. We learned some new language. We learned some new tricks. We didn't learn it all, but you guys are our ambassadors, our agents of change now. So we really ask, um, I know that Jazzy and her team of students and teachers that she works with um, is literally going on tour. Over the next six weeks, I think there's at least 10 uh, tour, tour stops scheduled, and we're open for more. There's the 10 right there. So these are middle schools and high schools. If the schools aren't on there yet, know that um, we, we are working with the BACR um, and our team to get those scheduled. But we really ask that you share as much of this information as you can with your neighbors and, and, and colleagues at your schools and help us um, address this in the best way that we can. And I, we feel so lucky in Marin County to have such great partners with our Health and Human Services team and Dr. Willis and San Francisco Marin Medical Society, Dr. Ma, we're so honored to have you here um, and, and to have teachers and students and uh, community partners that help us um, learn and get informed and help, you know, help uh, inform and, and educate our students and our families. So, so thank you so much for being here tonight. A huge, uh, how about a round of applause for our I'm sure that you know, if, you, if you have some one-on-one -on -one questions, our panelists, panelists might be around for a few more minutes here, but uh, thank you so much for being here tonight.